Welcome to my channel, where we continue the content of American history. Thank you for watching, and thank you for subscribing. Through the previous video, we learned that the establishment of the colony of Marseilles Bay was a Protestant colony of theocracy established by a group of Protestants holding the Bible in their hands and according to the biblical canonical system. In the Massachusetts Bay Colony, there was a Puritan leader named John Winthrop who coined a metaphor in 1630 to describe the ideal society they had established in the New World. Before sailing for North America, Winthrop gave a famous speech to his followers, calling their colony a city in the eyes of the whole world, and quoting the biblical words of Jesus to his disciples in Matthew chapter 5, You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Winthrop's purpose was to inspire his fellow citizens to follow God's will in their new land and build a just, peaceful, and prosperous society that would serve as an example for other nations and colonies. He believed that if they were able to achieve this, they would be blessed and protected by God, but if they violated God's moral law, they would be punished and condemned. Winthrop's speech influenced many politicians and thinkers in American history who saw the United States as a nation with a special mission and responsibility to provide a model of freedom, democracy, and justice for all mankind. This idea is known as American exceptionalism, and it embodies Americans' pride and optimism about their country and culture. From the first charter issued by the King of England to the present, Protestants have come to the Americas with a large number of immigrants, established colonies one after another, and various denominations have successively established homes in this part of the Americas, and even conservative Catholics are eager to yearn for this new world with infinite possibilities. There was a Catholic, his name was George Calvert, he was born in 1597 into a wealthy family in Yorkshire, England, and he received a good education at Trinity College, Oxford. He soon became a trusted and reused secretary and advisor to King James I. He served as Minister of State, a member of the House of Commons, and was even made Baron Baltimore. You might think he's already successful, but he has an even bigger dream, to build a colony in the Americas where Catholics and Protestants can coexist peacefully. So what was he going to do? It turned out that George Calvert was a devout Catholic, but in England at the time, Catholics were a persecuted and discriminated minority. They cannot profess their faith, hold public office, or enjoy equal rights. In order to maintain his position and influence, George Calvert could only secretly profess Catholicism, until 1625, when he finally couldn't bear it anymore, publicly declared himself a Catholic, and resigned from all official positions. This move cost him many friends and supporters, and made him a thorn in the side of Parliament and Protestants. George Calvert did not give up on his beliefs and ideals, and he decided to find a home for himself and his compatriots in the New World. He first attempted to establish a colony on the island of Newfoundland called Avalon, but this plan failed due to the harsh climate, barren land, sparse population, and conflicts with local Aboriginal and other colonists. Undeterred, George Calvert turned his attention further south to the Chesapeake Bay region. He applied to King Charles I for a charter for a piece of land, which was approved by the king. This land was later the colony of Maryland. The colony of Maryland was named after the king's wife, Henrietta Maria. She is a French princess and a Catholic. George Calvert wanted the colony to become a refuge for Catholics in the Americas, and to guarantee freedom of religion and equal rights for all people of different religions. This idea was very avant-garde and enlightened at the time, and earned the colony of Maryland a reputation as a pioneer of religious freedom. Unfortunately, George Calvert died shortly after receiving a charter from the Maryland colony, and he didn't see his dream come true firsthand. He handed over the administration of the colony to his son, Cecilius Calvert, the second Baron of Baltimore. Cecil Calvert was born in 1605, and Cecil Calvert inherited his father's title of nobility and colonial concession, but he did not travel to the New World himself, but stayed in England to deal with political affairs. He assigned the affairs of the American colonies to his younger brother, Leonard Calvert. Leonard Calvert was born in 1606 when his older brother, Cecil Calvert, asked him to lead the first colonists to the Chesapeake Bay Area. Welcome to my channel, where we continue the content of American history. Thank you for watching, and thank you for subscribing. On November 22, 1633, Leonard Calvert set out of England on two ships, called the Ark and the Dove. 
with about 300 colonists, both Catholics and Protestants. They had a long and difficult voyage, encountering storms, pirates, hunger, disease, and other difficulties along the way. They also stayed on the island of Barbados for some time, replenished supplies, and recruited more colonists. They eventually arrived at the Virginia colony on March 3, 1634, where they received some help and guidance. Leonard Calvert did not stay long in the Virginia colony, as he knew that the Protestants there were not friendly to Catholics and had territorial disputes over the Maryland colony. He led his colonists on a further voyage north, searching for a suitable settlement within the Chesapeake Bay. They arrived on March 25, 1634, on an island called Ujeacomico by the local Indians, and had a friendly conversation with the chief of the island, exchanging axes, knives, cloth, and other items for half of the island's land. This island was later known as St. Clemente, Clement's Island. Leonard Calvert held a Thanksgiving offering on San Clemente Island and declared the colony of Maryland official. He also erected a cross on the island to signify his faith in Catholicism. He then led the colonists to the other end of the island of Giacomico, where he established the first permanent settlement, St. Mary's City. He appointed his cronies as officials in the colonies and established a council elected by Freeman, the first democratically enacted law in North America. He also maintained good relations with the local Indians, traded and helped them with trade, and respected their customs and beliefs. Leonard Calvert's leadership in the Maryland colony was precarious, and he was repeatedly interfered with and threatened by the Virginia colony and the English Civil War. He also had to deal with conflict and violence between different sects within the colony of Maryland. He was once forced to flee the colony of Maryland and seek refuge in the Virginia colony. He was also arrested and imprisoned and stripped of the administration of the colony of Maryland. He eventually died in 1658 at the age of 52. He passed the administration of the Maryland colony to his nephew, Charles Calvert, a third-generation baron of Baltimore. Leonard Calvert was an adventurous and leadership man who personally led the first Maryland colonists to make peace with the local Indians, and contend with the neighboring Virginia colony, laying a solid foundation for the establishment and development of the Maryland colony. Although he did not enjoy the prosperity and stability of the Maryland colony, he left a valuable legacy for Maryland and the United States, freedom of religion and equal rights. This is a historical figure that deserves our respect and learning. Before his brother departed, Cecil Calvert gave his brother detailed instructions to be friendly with the local Indians, to maintain good relations with the neighboring Virginia colony, and to guarantee freedom of religion and equal rights to all people of different religions. These directives embodied Cecil Calvert's vision for the colony of Maryland, an ideal society that would be loyal to the British crown and accommodate both Catholics and Protestants. However, this vision is not easy to achieve. Cecil Calvert had to deal not only with challenges from the Virginia colonies to Maryland's territorial and trade rights, but also with the impact of the British Civil War on the political stability of the Maryland colonies. He also had to deal with conflict and violence between different sects within the colony of Maryland. In order to maintain freedom and order in the colony of Maryland, Cecil Calvert sent reinforcements and supplies on several occasions and solved the problem through legislative and diplomatic means. The most famous example of this is the Maryland Act of Faith Tolerance, passed in 1649, which was the first bill in North America to protect the rights of religious minorities and is considered the forerunner of the Religious Freedom Clause in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Cecil Calvert, who died in 1675, ruled the colony of Maryland for 43 years, making him the longest-lived colonial lord in North America. He passed the administration of the Maryland colony to his son, Charles Calvert, a third baron of Baltimore. Although he did not set foot on Maryland himself, he left a legacy for Maryland and the United States freedom of religion and equal rights. This is a historical figure that deserves our respect and learning. But at that time, Lord Baltimore's colony was actually a feudal domain, and why? First of all, we need to understand what feudalism is. Feudalism was a political and social system that flourished in medieval Europe. Under feudalism, the king or emperor was the supreme ruler and he divided land and power among nobles or churches in return for their allegiance and obedience. 
These nobles or churches were called lords and they could enjoy a high degree of autonomy and jurisdiction in their domains. The lord could then divide part of the land and power among the lower nobles or knights as their vassals. These lower ranking nobles or knights were called princes and they could also exercise some power in their own domains. The princes could redivide some of their land and power among peasants or tenants as a condition for them to cultivate the land and pay taxes. These peasants or tenants were called serfs and they were the people at the bottom of society without any freedom and rights. Welcome to my channel where we continue the content of American history. Thank you for watching and thank you for subscribing. Why, then, was Lord Baltimore's colony a feudal fiefdom legally speaking? This was because Lord Baltimore received an edict from King Charles I of England granting him a plot of about 12 million acres, 49,000 square kilometers, on the North American continent and giving him absolute dominion and legislative power. This means that Lord Baltimore is not only the owner of the land, but the lord of the land. He could make laws, collect taxes, appoint officials, issue currency, grant titles of nobility, establish churches, go to war and make peace, and so on. He didn't even need to swear allegiance to the King of England, but only paid two arrows a year as a symbolic tribute. This was equivalent to the King transferring his sovereignty over the North American continent to Lord Baltimore, making him a semi-independent monarch. Lord Baltimore wanted to introduce a feudal system similar to the European manor system into his colonies, and he planned to have each gentleman who settled on his land with five servants to build a 2,000 acre, 8.1 square kilometers, estate cubed. This gentleman enjoyed all the British privileges, such as the wearing of various illustrious decorations of nobility, which distinguished the Lord of the Manor from the common people. The Lord of the Manor could in turn lease part of the land to peasants or tenants for rent or labor. This created a feudal hierarchy of Baltimore lords, estate owners, peasants or tenants. However, Lord Baltimore's feudal dreams were not fully realized. On the one hand, his colony attracted many immigrants of different religions, such as Protestants, Puritans, Quakers, etc., who were unwilling to accept Lord Baltimore's Catholic rule and submit to his feudal system. They opposed Lord Baltimore's tyranny and greed and demanded more democracy and freedom. On the other hand, the British King and Parliament were also dissatisfied with the dictatorship and opulence of Lord Baltimore, and they sought to weaken his power and revenue, restricting his trade and taxes. They even wanted to revoke his edict and turn his colony into a royal colony, with the King appointing a governor directly. These internal and external pressures forced Lord Baltimore to compromise and make concessions, gradually abandoning his feudal system in favor of a more modern and democratic political system. And what about a man named William Cliburn who claimed partial ownership of the colony of Maryland? And that led to a decades-long dispute. William Cliburn was an English explorer, surveyor, trader, and colonist who came to the Virginia colony in 1621 and soon became a wealthy estate owner and politician. During his exploration of the Chesapeake Bay, he discovered Kent Island, an ideal base for fur trading, close to the territory of the Saskananark Indians. He obtained permission from the Virginia Council in 1629 to establish a trading post on the island of Kent, and in 1631 from King Charles I to trade in the Americas, where no other patents were made. Cliburn considered himself the rightful owner and ruler of the island of Kent, so he established a small colonial society on the island with its own laws, taxes, currency, army, and church. However, Cliburn's happy life was soon shattered, in 1632, King Charles I granted the land between the east and west shores of the Chesapeake Bay to George Calvert, the first Lord of Baltimore, in return for creating a Catholic colony. This land is the colony of Maryland, which includes the island of Kent. The Calverts were British aristocrats and politicians who were persecuted and discriminated against because of their Catholic beliefs. They wanted to build a utopia of religious freedom and tolerance in the New World, attracting immigrants of all faiths. The Calverts had autocratic power over the Maryland colony, and they could make laws, appoint officials, grant titles of nobility, collect taxes, issue currency, and more. They also did not need to pay any fees or tribute to the king, only to give the king two arrows each year as a symbol. When the Calverts learned of Cliburn's activities on the island of Kent, they immediately warned him to stop trade and recognize the authority of the colony of Maryland. 
Refusing to obey, Cliburn insisted that he was the rightful owner of the Isle of Kent and that he was not under the jurisdiction of the colony of Maryland or the British King. He appealed to the British government for protection of his rights and interests on the island of Kent. However, the British government was not very interested in this distant dispute. They only ambiguously expressed their support for Cliburn and did not take any real action. Thus began a 40-year struggle between the two sides, involving legal, political, economic and military aspects. The Talbot sent an armed fleet to attempt to capture the island of Kent, but were met with resistance from Clayburn. In 1635, the first naval battle took place at the Chesapeake Bay, the first in the history of North America. The battle ended in the defeat of the Calverts, whose ships were sunk or captured by Cliburn ships. However, the Calverts did not give up, and in 1637 they sent another, more powerful fleet, this time successfully capturing the island of Kent and arresting Cliburn's agents. Cliburn himself fled back to Virginia, where he continued to turn to the British government for help, but did not receive any effective support. Cliburn did not give up his desire for the Isle of Kent, and in 1642, he took advantage of the chaos of the English Civil War to unite a number of Maryland colonists who opposed the Calvert family to launch a rebellion in an attempt to retake the Isle of Kent. He had the support of the British Parliament, which and the Calverts were hostile. He was appointed governor of the colony of Maryland and led an army attacking St. Mary's City, the capital of the colony of Maryland. He captured St. Mary's in 1644 and declared the colony of Maryland to be the colony of Virginia. However, his victory was short-lived, and the Calverts recaptured St. Mary's in 1646 and regained control of the colony of Maryland. Cliburn's last attempt to retake the Isle of Kent was in 1660, when the English crown was restored and Charles II became king. Cliburn hoped that the king would support his claim and revoke the Calvert family's patents. He united with a number of other opponents of the Calvert family, and submitted a petition to the king for the restoration of his rights on the island of Kent. However, the king did not heed his petition and went on to recognize the Calvert family's power over the Maryland colony. When Cliburn died around 1677, Kent Island was still part of the colony of Maryland. Of course, the colony of Maryland faced not only the problem of Cliburn's territorial claims, but also other troubles and the first governor of the colony of Maryland, Leonard Calvert, the younger brother of Lord Baltimore, convened the first council of the colony of Maryland in 1635. The purpose of this parliament was to make some laws and rules to govern the colonies, as well as to settle some disputes and problems. These laws and rules include information on land, taxation, trade, religion, crime, punishment, etc. So would Lord Baltimore allow such a council to exist? According to what I said earlier, the colony of Maryland was actually a feudal territory and should have the absolute power and feudal privileges of the colony of Maryland, so Lord Baltimore should be able to rule the land as he pleased and of course he could ignore the will and interests of the colonists. That is, the colony of Maryland should be regarded as Lord Baltimore's own private kingdom. But in fact, Lord Baltimore was not a stupid or greedy man, he was a man of vision and wisdom and he knew that if he wanted to retain his power and wealth in the Maryland colony, he had to satisfy and be loyal to the colonists. He knew that if he was too harsh or unfair to the colonizers, he would provoke their revolt and resentment. If he does not give some freedom and rights to the colonizers, he will lose their support and trust. That is, he knew that if he did not involve the colonists in making laws and rules, he would definitely be interfered with and threatened by the British government and other colonies. So, Lord Baltimore decided to establish a council to give the colonists the opportunity to express their opinions and demands, to give them the opportunity to monitor and balance the behavior of the governors and lords, and to give them the opportunity to enjoy some democratic and constitutional principles. In doing so, Lord Baltimore could both show his tolerance and generosity while cementing his position and prestige in the Maryland colony. Of course, this did not mean that Lord Baltimore had completely abandoned his feudal privileges. In fact, he still retained many powers and interests, such as appointing governors, lords, judges and other officials, granting privileges such as land and titles of nobility, approving or vetoing laws passed by the council, and so on. However, it also meant that Lord Baltimore had to cooperate and compromise with Parliament and could not violate or change the laws, 
and rules set by Parliament at will. This also meant that Lord Baltimore had to respect and protect some of the fundamental rights and freedoms of the colonists, such as freedom of religion, freedom of speech, jury trial, and so on. In this way, the first council of the colony of Maryland deprived Lord Baltimore of his full feudal privileges, but also earned him the respect and loyalty of the colonists. It also laid a solid foundation for the future development of the colony of Maryland, making it a wealthy and prosperous colony, and also made an important contribution to the independence and democracy of the United States. Because from the perspective of the general background of the times, the reform of the feudal system has begun to rise in Britain at this time, also known as the Bourgeois Revolution, so we will temporarily go back to understand this reform in Britain. Feudalism has had a profound impact on the history of England. Welcome to my channel, where we continue the content of American history. Thank you for watching, and thank you for subscribing. From the Norman Conquest in 1066, England was heavily feudal, with kings, nobles, churches, knights, and peasants each having different rights and obligations. Over time, the feudal system gradually changed and declined. On the one hand, with the development of commerce and cities, a new class emerged, the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie refers to those who engage in industrial and commercial activities, such as merchants, artisans, lawyers, etc. They had wealth and knowledge, but no land and no political power. They were dissatisfied and rebellious against the feudal system, and they demanded more freedom and equality. On the other hand, with the formation and unification of the state, the king gradually strengthened his own centralized power. The king tried to weaken the power of the nobility and the church, expanding his own taxes and military. They felt bound and threatened by the feudal system, and they demanded more absolute and autocraticism. In this way, feudalism became an obstacle to the development of English society and a source of contradictions. From 1640 onwards, a bourgeois revolution broke out in England, also known as the Puritan Revolution or the English Civil War. The revolution was a fierce struggle between two classes, two ideas, two political systems represented by King Charles I and the Long Parliament. The Long Congress was a parliamentary faction made up of opposition factions such as the bourgeoisie, the petty aristocracy, and the Puritans. They advocated limiting the power of the king, protecting the freedoms and rights of the people, and introducing parliamentary democracy and religious reform. King Charles I was a royalist group made up of great nobles, Catholics, and other conservatives. They advocated the maintenance of the sanctity of the king, the maintenance of feudal hierarchy and privileges, and the absolutism of royal power and religious unity. In this revolution, the Long Congress began to systematically destroy those that were left of feudalism. They adopted a series of laws and measures aimed at weakening the power and interests of the king, the nobility, the church, and expanding the power and interests of the parliament, the bourgeoisie, and the people. Here are some specific examples. In 1641, the Long Congress passed the 39 Articles, which abolished the king's prerogative courts such as the Star Chamber Court and the High Council, which were used by the king as a tool to persecute the opposition. In 1641, the Long Congress passed the Triangular Trade Act, which abolished the king's monopoly on colonial trade and allowed any English merchant to participate freely in colonial trade. In 1641, the Long Congress passed the Habeas Corpus Act, which provided that anyone arrested had the right to a judge's trial and prohibited any unlawful arrest and detention. In 1642, the Long Parliament passed a great protest, demanding that the king hand over the leadership of important departments such as the army, navy, foreign affairs, and finance to Parliament, and recognize Parliament's right to the final interpretation of laws. In 1646, the Long Parliament passed the Treaty of Oxford, demanding that the king disband his personal guard, relinquish his control over the church and the army, and agree to be tried by Parliament. In 1649, the Long Parliament passed the Regency Act, abolishing the monarchy, declaring England a republic, and establishing a Regency Council headed by Parliamentary President Cromwell. In 1650, the Long Congress passed the Land Bill, confiscating the land and property of Charles I and his supporters and distributing them to the revolutionaries and the army. In 1653, the Long Parliament passed the Arbitration Order, abolishing the House of Lords and transferring its powers to the House of Commons. 
These laws and measures were a serious blow and destruction to the feudal system, and they greatly changed the political and social landscape of England and laid the foundation for the modernization of England. So let's go back to the colony of Maryland, which at this time also had a bill that was ahead of the world. And that was the Tolerance Act, which was a law passed in 1649 that gave all Trinitarian Christians, both Catholics and Protestants, the right to freedom of worship in the Maryland colony, and punished those who denied the divinity of Jesus or slandered the beliefs of others. The law, which is believed to be the first written law on religious tolerance in US history, was also enacted to protect the Catholic minority. Why, then, did the colony of Maryland have such a law? The first settlers from the colony of Maryland arrived at Chesapeake Bay in 1634 and stopped at St. Mary's River. Mary's River, the first settlement, was established along the shores of St. Mary's. Mary City. These immigrants included both Catholics and Protestants, all of whom wanted religious freedom and economic opportunity in the New World. However, Colony Maryland was not a paradise of peace and tranquility. It faces a variety of challenges and threats from both internal and external sources. Internally, there are differences of faith and conflict of interest between Catholics and Protestants, especially as Protestants gradually overtake Catholics, and Catholics fear that they will lose their power and protection. Externally, the colony of Maryland was interfered with and encroached upon by neighboring Virginia colonies and New England colonies all of which were dominated by Anglican or Puritan Christianity and were hostile and distrustful of Catholicism. In addition, there was turmoil and change in the English homeland, with the English Civil War and the Puritan Revolution leading to the execution of King Charles I, the establishment of a Republican form of government and the intervention and control of the colony of Maryland. Against this background, Cecil Calvert drafted the Tolerance Act, and urged the Maryland Colonial Assembly to pass the act in order to maintain its authority and interests in the Maryland colony, to protect the freedom of belief of Catholics and other religious minorities, to ease the contradictions and conflicts among the colonists, and to attract more immigrants to the Maryland colony. The main contents of the Tolerance Act are as follows. Recognize the freedom of belief of Trinitarian Christians, whether Catholic or Protestant, in the colony of Maryland without any punishment or discrimination. Anyone who attacks or denigrates the beliefs of others with malicious or profane language is prohibited from doing so, and is liable to a fine or imprisonment. It is forbidden for anyone to deny that Jesus is the Son of God or the Saviour, otherwise they will be sentenced to death. As can be seen, the Act of Tolerance was not a law of complete equality and freedom. It only granted tolerance to Trinitarian Christians, but not to other faiths, such as Judaism, Islam, Indianism, etc. It is also not a permanent and stable law, it has been repealed or restored many times with political and social changes. However, the Tolerance Act remained an epoch-making law, it was the first written law on religious tolerance in American history, it reflected the pursuit and respect for religious freedom of the founders and residents of the colony of Maryland, it influenced the legislation and protection of religious freedom in other colonies and later in the United States Federation, and of course the starting point for religious freedom in the modern sense. At this time, North America had different colonies, some of which belonged to the British, some to France, some to the Netherlands, and some tribes between the colonies, which were not only inhabited by indigenous peoples, but also by scattered European immigrants who were mixed with the Indians. Welcome to my channel, where we continue the content of American history. Thank you for watching, and thank you for subscribing. Then the Dutch in the Hudson River Valley, who settled in the Upper Nassau Fortress in 1614, founded New Amsterdam on May 4, 1626, which is now New York. First, we need to understand why the Dutch would want to establish colonies in North America. The Netherlands is a small country, but it is a strong country. In the 17th century, the Netherlands was one of the wealthiest and most open countries in Europe, with a strong maritime trade and colonial empire, and its merchants and explorers spread across the globe. The Dutch interest in North America was primarily driven by economic and strategic considerations. They wanted to open up the fur trade in North America, competing with France and England while protecting their interests in the Caribbean and South America. To achieve this, the Dutch formed a business organization called the Dutch West India Company, which was supported and authorized by the Dutch government to trade and colonize North America, South America, Africa, and the Caribbean. 
1624, the Dutch West India Company sent a group of immigrants to the east coast of North America, and they established settlements on Manhattan Island, Long Island, and along the Hudson River, which they called New Netherland. The first governor of New Netherland was Peter Minnit, who arrived on the island of Manhattan on May 4, 1626, to take over the colony there. He found Manhattan Island to be an ideal place, located between the Chesapeake Bay and New England, a central location on the east coast of North America with a good harbor and rivers, a hub for the fur trade, and a fertile land and abundant resources, making it a great place to build cities and farms. As a result, Minnit decided to establish a permanent colony on the island of Manhattan and named it New Amsterdam in honor of Amsterdam, the capital of the Netherlands. In order to gain ownership of Manhattan Island, Minnit made a deal with a local Indian and he exchanged 60 guilders, about $24 worth of goods for Manhattan Island. The deal was later considered one of the most unequal in history, but in reality both sides felt like they were taking advantage of it at the time. For the Indians, they did not consider themselves to own the land, but only to use it. They felt that it was a good deal to trade something precious for a piece of land that they didn't frequent. For the Dutch, they didn't know how big and valuable Manhattan Island was, but just wanted a stable and safe base. They felt it was wise to exchange some cheap items for a favorable piece of land. After gaining ownership of Manhattan Island, Minnie began to work on the construction of New Amsterdam. He built a castle at the southern end of the island to protect the harbor and the river, and he also built a number of houses and warehouses around the castle to house immigrants and goods. He also carved out some streets and canals on the island to facilitate transportation and drainage. He also encouraged immigrants of all religions and ethnicities to come to New Amsterdam to make it a pluralistic and inclusive society. The founding of New Amsterdam marked the beginning of the Dutch colonization of North America, and it laid the foundation for the future development of Manhattan Island and New York City. However, New Amsterdam did not remain in Dutch hands for long and it was occupied by the British in 1664 and renamed New York. That's another story, more on that later. Thank you for watching this video and see you in the next one.